Hi everyone, my name is Ashley. Um, I am from Lending Club in San Francisco and I'm a DevOps engineer. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, when I first joined Lending Club about three years ago, one of my first projects was to work with Neo4j and build software around it. Um, so it has a special place in my heart. All right, so as I mentioned, I work at Lending Club. We are America's largest online credit marketplace serving peer-to-peer -peer loans, small business loans, patient financing, and as of earlier this year, auto refinancing. Um, I'm sure you guys care more about the technology at Lending Club, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm on the infrastructure and tools team, which is oftentimes referred to as the DevOps team. So we build software and infrastructure automation to enable Lending Club to efficiently and seamlessly deliver our applications into production while ensuring stability, resiliency, um, scalability, what we like to call all the illities. Um, so more specifically, we write software to handle our infrastructure mapping, which I'll talk about more later, um, infrastructure and app monitoring and alerting, a lot of deployment automation, cloud orchestration, and um, common app frameworks that all of our platform applications use. Um, so up until recently, we were running only out of a data center. Um, and then about two years ago, we started to migrate our services into AWS. So another philosophy that kind of embodies everything that my team does at Lending Club and also something that I'd kind of like to frame this talk with is to be pragmatic and not dogmatic. Um, so over the years, we've worked toward a consistent and unified um, build, packaging, and deployment pipeline. Um, and what this means for us is whether our apps are written in Java or Node or Go, and whether we're deploying that app into production AWS or non -prod, um, the non-prod data center, um, everything should look, feel, deploy, and run the same way. Um, so we've also tried to avoid tool trends. Um, today, for example, the big thing is Docker and microservices. Tomorrow, the next big thing is sure to be something different. And so we want our infrastructure to be flexible enough to handle those changes. Um, so Neo4j actually has helped us a lot in working towards this goal, and I'll cover that also um, a, bit, a bit later. So like most of you, or many of you, um, as we've grown from five microservices to 500 microservices, and as we've moved from the data center to the cloud, uh, we've sought to make our lives a bit easier by automating all the things. Uh, as we soon found out, we have a lot of things, and it's really hard to automate everything if you don't know what all those things are. So looking at this slide, you probably recognize most, if not all, um, of these technologies. A common problem I think that all of us probably face is figuring out the relationships and integrations between and among all these tools. Um, so oftentimes when we're onboarding a new technology or maybe considering different options, for a technology, uh, we'll look at the built-in integrations to see whether um, that tool is compatible with our existing infrastructure. Um, so, for example, if New Relic doesn't play nice with PagerDuty, does that mean that we can't use one of those tools? Um, if the integrations that we want don't already exist, then how are we uh, managing those? How are we, um, are we making hundreds of REST calls to dozens of endpoints? So enter Mercator. So Mercator is Lending Club's internal Java application whose job it is to communicate with our infrastructure components and then to build a graph model of those components. And um, surprise, it uses Neo4j. Um, so we need models to help us visualize our systems and by extension to help us diagnose and track down problems when they arise within those systems. Um, so this is what Mercator does for us. Um, so Mercator is periodically calling out to our third-party tools and integrations and then making sense of those responses by creating relationships and saving those relationships and nodes into Neo4j. Um, so this then provides us with metadata around which we can build our automation, um, monitoring, and alerting. 
And so three years ago, we were stuck doing very manual deployments. We were managing our services in an Excel spreadsheet, and we had very low visibility into our um, infrastructure. So we were looking for a way to be able to write real-time queries that would return um, the current state of our infrastructure. Um, so we wrote Mercator. And I don't know if any of you were at Graph Connect two years ago, but I gave a talk on it back then, and back then this was called MacGyver. Um, so what we actually did recently is, um, so MacGyver was kind of like a do-everything type of app for our DevOps team. Um, my boss likes to refer to MacGyver as like a floor wax and a dessert topping. So what we did earlier this year is we split out all of the graph scanning functionality into an open source, um, into open source software, which is Mercator. And in case anyone is wondering where the name comes from, uh, Mercator is a, is, a, is a map projection named after a geographer by the same name. So this is like our projection. OK, so this is a visualization of the data that we store in Neo4j, or some of it. Um, Oh, I guess it doesn't quite fit, but that's okay. So this is from the Neo4j console, which you guys are probably pretty familiar with. Um, so each of these circles is a node um, or a label, and then the lines connecting those nodes are relationships. So um, originally in the screenshot, it, was, it would show each label type. But so the yellow node is um, what we at Lending Club call a virtual service. This is our concept of an application. So in this example, our app ID here is called LCUI. And you'll see that it contains in blue the two pools, a pool A and a pool B. And then each pool, in turn, contains a bunch of virtual servers. So what we're looking at right here is actually a visualization of our blue-green deployment model in the data center. Um, so. I guess, how did we get to this visualization? Um, so initially, when we first started building out our graph model, um, we just wanted to know what we had deployed out there. Like We didn't know what we had in prod versus non-prod. Um, so to answer that question, we had all of our app instances um, call in to Mercator every 90 seconds with um, app info. App info. And so this app info included things like what app is running on that server, um, what version of that app, as well as what environment that instance is running in, um, and its IP and host name. And just by adding this, actually, we gained um, a, dis a service discovery feature that we didn't have before. Uh, so we then combined our app instances with um, load balancer information. So Mercator then. Uh, calls out to our load balancers and scans um, the load balancer information every, I think, every few minutes, or every minute, actually. And so whereas the app instances return information on the app, the load balancer has information more on like the state of the server. Um, so again, the host name, but also the status of a server, so whether it is live or dark. Um, so if it's status, if the status of a server is active, for example, that means it's taking requests. And the load balancer also has information on how many requests are currently open to that server. So now we have app instance information and load balancer server information. If we then map um, those two together by their host name, then we can combine all these properties and we're left with the virtual server uh, node. Um, so now we have app ID, environment, revision, hostname, IP status, and traffic. So in that example, the visualization that you saw earlier, um, uh, that yellow node, right, which was our, or actually I guess all the nodes, the app ID would be LCUI. And for example, the environment here, let's say, is production. We can track the exact revision of the app that is deployed on the instance as well as its hostname and IP. Um, and we can see that it's active and has 78 open uh, requests that are made to it. So going back to this um, illustration, um, hopefully it should make a little more sense now. Um, so actually going back. So this right here is a virtual server. So then on this illustration, so what that virtual server is one pink node. And so you can kind of start to see if you group all of these pink nodes, these virtual servers by environment and app ID and some lending club um, host name naming conventions, then you can see how these servers kind of get grouped into two separate pools. 
And, and then if you group the pools by app ID and environment, then you can kind of start to see how the pools will get grouped into a virtual service. Um, so this, just this basic scanning of our app instances and our load balancer servers is what allowed us to automate our data center um, blue-green deployments. Um, before, we didn't have a good or a strong concept of like which servers were in what pool and which pools were live. Um, and this kind of enabled us to get a, bit of, a better visual, visualization and picture of that. Um, in addition, we were able to actually set up a lot of alerts and monitoring off of this functionality. So for example, um, we set up an alert around whether a server in a pool was down. So if the status of the live pool servers, for example, showed up um, as anything other than active, um, we'll get alerted and we'll investigate to see, like, well, is the pool degraded? Is the pool completely down? Um, maybe that, that server needs an, a restart, et cetera. Um, we also never want multiple revisions of a single app to be deployed within a single pool. So we have an alert on that as well. If um, an app instance phones home and all the instances in a certain pool have one revision and then there's one with a different one, we'll quickly deploy to that one and correct that problem. Um, another uh, feature we were able to add off this is, so once we got vCenter scanning um, into Mercator, you can imagine that each virtual server would have a one-to-one -one mapping to a vCenter instance, and then all of the vCenter instances live on arrays. Um, so if, for any given app, one pool, all of the servers are hosted on one array, um, that's a single point of failure. Because if that array were to go down, then we would have an outage. Um, so we also get alerted on that, and um, if that happens, we'll like redis redistribute the VMs to different arrays. Um, so that was our data center example, and it was working great up until two years ago when we decided to start migrating our services uh, to the cloud. And one of our goals was, um, so we moved to AWS, and one of our goals was to replicate this blue-green deployment model um, within the cloud. And really, it works exactly the same way. So Mercator is periodically scanning a bunch of um, AWS services. So things like SNS, SQS, IAM, RDS. Um, it's just making calls out using the um, Amazon's SDK and pulling back information and then writing that into Neo4j. So again, this is a visualization of some of our AWS components. And there's really like no need to understand this illustration completely. Um, it's just kind of meant to show how quickly all these components get pretty complicated and how interdependent and interrelated they all are. Um, and again, this is like, this is only AWS and not even everything in AWS. And so you can see like there's no way that our minds would ever be able to comprehend or keep track of all this information. Um, but luckily, Neo4j kind of does that for us. Um, it allows us to track all of our infrastructure and like not even just in the data center or just in AWS, but this is like all of our infrastructure. Um, so this particular cloud model is um, what, or I guess graphing this cloud model and like storing it in Neo4j is what eventually allowed us to orchestrate all of our AWS deployments and replicate that blue-green model of deployment from the data center in AWS. In addition, it also allowed our um, developers to, um, I guess, take more service ownership and, uh, and be able to self-service more. They were able to spin up their own instances and app clusters. Um, on their own instead of having to maybe like write a ticket, open it with us, and wait for us to spin up um, a data center VM for them. Okay. So now we've seen like a data center example and kind of a basic cloud visualization and have somewhat of a basic understanding of how our graph model works. Uh, but there is a lot more that we store in Neo4j. So I kind of just want to take a step back and maybe walk through the app lifecycle and all of these um, components that go into it. Um, so when an app um, is first created, we write documentation in our wiki and Confluence. Um, PMs and developers will then talk with each other to write stories and assign tickets in Jira. Developers um, will commit code to GitHub. They'll use Jenkins to build that code, and the artifacts will get stored into Artifactory or S3. 
Again, we use Jenkins and also AWS Code Deploy to deploy to AWS or the data center. Um, we have our three big monitoring tools, Splunk, New Relic, and uh, Wavefront. Um, a lot of discussion, troubleshooting um, goes on in HipChat, and we'll get page through pager duty or Ops Genie. Um, there's storage, there's Cisco UCS. I think you can kind of get the idea. All of these components from the app lifecycle, we are scanning all these things and storing them in Neo4j. And so you can imagine just this huge map of interrelated um, infrastructure components. Um, so as we've gone from five microservices to 500, um, they've all followed this app lifecycle, and they've all been managed from app conception to deployment to monitoring and beyond with Mercator. And we went from having very low service vis visibility, tracking things on Excel spreadsheets, um, to having this central unified graph model that we can query at any time and get back um, real-time information on our infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we can answer questions like, do we have a single point of failure? Um, are revisions synced across different environments? Um, so our graph model has really allowed us to get ahead of problems and hopefully prevent outages before they occur. And in the case when outages do occur, um, our graph model puts us in a much better position to diagnose the issue um, and to visualize the state of our infrastructure at any given point in time. I guess another point I want to make is that the growth of our graph model happened very naturally and organically. So three years ago, when I first started to build out our graph model, um, I definitely was not planning on all of this going in there. Right? It started with the very simple, we just want service discovery. We want to know what instances are out there. Um, we went from that, and over the years, our graph model has changed and evolved with our infrastructure. And we've arrived here. Um, and so I think it really kind of highlights how flexible um, Neo4j is and how easy it is to um, build on top of existing nodes and relationships and properties and even modify existing ones so that your data set kind of grows and evolves with your infrastructure. Um, I'm not saying that like you should use a graph database for every single use case, but definitely at Lending Club it has worked out really, really well for us, which is why we continue, we're continuing to build um, and use this exact same model. So if tomorrow we were, for example, to use Docker, we would follow the same model of Mercator, um, calling out to Docker, scanning for Docker components, um, maybe Docker swarms, Docker services, Docker containers, and then saving all those components into Neo4j and mapping relationships between those components and already existing infrastructure. Okay, so, let's see. I'm going to do a demo um, to show some of the stuff that's in our graph model and maybe to highlight um, I don't know, some of the reports that we've generated off of all this information and um, how it's been useful to us. So first, I just want to show some of our infrastructure components within AWS. Okay, so this is my local Neo4j database, and actually it is cloned from our production Neo4j database. Um, I scrubbed out certain things, like our account numbers, just in case any of you are trying to hack us or something. Um, so here you'll see, so this is Cypher, which is Neo4j's um, query language. And you'll see right here, all I've done is ask um, for Neo4j to return all of our AWS accounts, which um, it's not super interesting. There's just non-prod, prod, and um, the infrastructure account. If I then filter um, to just return the prod account, and then maybe start to show some of the relationships and things that are contained within this account, you'll see then, so here's our account in purple. And you'll see then now that our prod account owns some S3 buckets, some SNS topics, and four VPCs. Um, so now if we start to dig a little deeper, and let's say I want to look specifically at the VPCs that are contained in the, oops, in the prod account. 
Oh no. Okay, hold on. Um, it's okay. This has happened before. When I try and do live demos, stuff always happens. Um, okay, I'm gonna start this. It might take a while. Wow, oh, okay. Okay, cool. So what we're looking at here, um, so again, we have our AWS account, and you'll see in pink those four um, VPCs. And so now we're starting to get into security groups, endpoints, and subnets. Um, and so not to, like, not to belabor the point, but if we just go one more level down, So here we'll start to see, um, we're kind of getting more into the EC2 instances, our auto scaling groups, our load balancers, RDS instances. And if you think back to the visualization that I showed earlier that I was like, it's okay if you don't understand all this because it's kind of complicated. Um, this is more or less the same, the same visualization now that we're looking at. And again, like, we could keep just kind of going deeper and deeper into this graph, and we would start to see, for example, maybe how the EC2 instances have relationships to the code deploy deployments and the code deploy applications. Um, the EC2 instances belong to auto scaling groups. ELBs distribute traffic to the EC2 instances. Um, auto scaling groups and ELBs can be attached to each other. So really, it's it's quite a complicated model, um, and so this. Uh, so Neo4j is keeping track of all these relationships. And again, like I mentioned, this is what enabled us to replicate our blue-green model of deployment, not our blue-green model, the blue-green model of deployment from, that we were using in the data center um, into AWS. Okay, so that's like all mildly interesting, but maybe not super useful. Um, there is actually, I guess maybe it's worth uh, mentioning there is actually software that um, you can pay for that will do this exact same thing. You put in like you give it like your uh, Amazon key, and it will go out and start scanning all these things, and then create a map, uh, a map, a graph visualization or representation of all your AWS infrastructure. Um, I don't know how much it costs, but I thought it was kind of funny. Um, okay, so how much does this stuff cost? So this is something that like my manager or like our VP might care more about. Um, this question actually came up in a meeting. Um, we were going over like AWS budgeting and I guess we didn't have a super clear picture of what our AWS costs were going to look like at the end of the month or maybe like what our, what our trend was looking like, like this is okay, this is not okay. Um, so this question came up in a meeting and because we have all the EC2 instance information already stored in Neo4j, um, it was literally a matter of minutes before we were able to come up with um, this query. Um, so what this query is doing is just matching all our EC2 instances to this other label type. Um, this label type contains the um, EC2 model, which is maybe c4.large, t2.medium, as well as the hourly costs of running an instance. Um, so it's mapping those together and then returning grouped by account, region, and instance type. Um, it returns our monthly cost in descending order. Um, and again, like within, in that meeting, it was, it was literally a matter of minutes. We came up with this query. Um, and so now we generate reports off of this every, every week. Um, we also send these stats to Wavefront so that we can kind of plot um, what our costs, our AWS costs look like, as well as where we kind of project them to be if they follow the same trend. Um, and we could really group these any way we want. Um, we can group them if we just wanted to show account or just by region or just by instance type, we could do all of those things um, very easily. Um, we can even graph, or sorry, plot the cost according to, where did my, oh, according to, um, by app. So we have this other node type called app definition, and this is just Lending Club's um, concept or definition of an app. And so this has information um, on the apps themselves, and so if we match the EC2 instances according to app, then we can plot 
which of our apps are costing us the most or the least um, by month. So for example, our Docker host costs kind of a lot. Maybe like these ones down here cost a good amount, but we can see that there's a lot of instances, so maybe not as big of a deal. Um, so you can do really interesting and cool stuff, and it's all enabled because we have all of our infrastructure components kind of loaded um, already into Neo4j. Um, so what is this? So this is something that, again, maybe like my manager or our VP of tech ops or maybe someone from InfoSec comes running over and they might, they might say, hey, this IP has been logging a lot or we just got an alert or we're, we're getting some strange, sending out some strange requests. Um, and so again, using the information that is in iGraph database, we can match the IP um, to its app instance. So way back in the beginning when I was showing all the different app instances, they have their IP information. And so if we then map our app instance to a virtual server and then to the pool and the virtual service and the actual app definition, uh, we can go from not knowing um, what this IP is to knowing everything about the IP. So we can get the host name. We know exactly what app is deployed on that instance as well as the version of the app that's on the instance. Um, we know, okay, well this is in production. So this is maybe is a serious issue, um, not just something that's happening in demo or stage. Um, through our naming convention, the 200s, I know that this is pool B. And so I can say, oh, okay, well pool B is in the dark pool. So maybe it's not as big of a deal as we originally thought. But if, for example, this host was in the live pool and was causing problems and we needed to restart it, we could also have diagnostics on, okay, well, it has this much traffic, do we really want to reset all these connections, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see how just, just this one query, um, you go from not knowing anything to, to kind of having all this information about the host and what's deployed and like how we should troubleshoot and what kind of actions and steps we should take. Um, you can imagine also if we decided to dig deeper in troubleshooting, we could map the um, app definition to a GitHub repo or to certain Jenkins jobs to see like when was this built, when was this code pushed, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So. So that's the story of how we have used a graph model at Lending Club to manage our infrastructure and run the company. Um, I would like to kind of recap some of the big picture points on what this graph model has allowed us to do. So I mentioned before, um, you can't automate all the things if you don't know what all the things are. And I think with our graph model, we definitely have a very clear visualization of our infrastructure. And again, I mentioned some of the monitoring and alerting capabilities that we gain just from um, using our, our graph model. Things like single points of failures, um, our revision synced, um, um, what was the other one? Oh, oh, if servers are down or not. Um, all of our deployment and cloud orchestration and the unified deployment model that we've recreated in the cloud has all been built around the graph model and our metadata that's stored within Neo4j. Um, but in addition, we are able to do automated patching. So in AWS, we keep track of the image that is attached to every EC2 instance. And if that image is older than, let's say, 14 days or 30 days or whatever we decide, then our software will detect that and automatically roll those instances forward onto the most recent image. Um, another kind of cool thing we do is um, we have nightly replication from our primary site to our secondary site in the data center and our primary region in AWS to our secondary region. So anything that's deployed in our primary sites, um, our software will pick that up and then deploy the exact same version of the exact same apps into our secondary sites. So we don't have to manually do that stuff anymore. Um, and so what that means for us is um, we can be more hands off. We don't get those late night pages and alerts. Um, and in addition, because we spend less time manually patching or um, replicating um, or deploying to our secondary sites, we have more time to build cool stuff. So the graph model has also allowed us to push for DevOps as a culture instead of just as a team name or a title. 
Um, we've built a lot of software around Mercator that um, exposes Mercator's data not just to our team, but also to um, our release teams, our engineers, QA, engineering efficiency, even like the risk teams. And so what this does is that um, it's enabled the engineers and other teams to leverage this data for themselves. They can uh, build their own automation using this information instead of maybe asking us to create an endpoint for them or um, opening a ticket, asking us to write a feature. Um, it's allowed them to self-service a lot more and also has given them the ability to take more ownership over their apps and write their own monitoring and alerting scripts. Um, and lastly, this circles back to my opening statement. So with this graph model, we are able to treat all of our third-party tools um, exactly the same. We have a standard and unified pipeline. We're not locked into any particular technology or tool. So if we were to use Docker, um, it would be no problem. Or if our CTO decided tomorrow we're switching from AWS to Microsoft Azure or um, Google Cloud or Oracle Cloud, um, in terms of our graph model, very little would change. Um, and so this is what gives us the flexibility when it comes to infrastructure and when it comes to the next big thing at Lending Club. That's it. Um, so here's my Twitter handle. Um, open Source Mercator is at that link. And then um, NeoRx is a Neo4j client that we've written with um, using uh, Rx Java observables. Um, yeah, that's it. So any questions? Wait, sorry, I can't hear you at all. We started Neo4j first. So Neo4j came like three years ago. We started getting like service discovery. Um, we started scanning our load balancers and like um, vCenter. And then two years ago is when we started, the decision came from our CTO to start migrating some of our services into AWS. Um, but we decided to just kind of follow the same model of scanning our scanning our third-party infrastructure components and then loading that into Neo4j. So a lot of the stuff like the app definitions, um, um, virtual servers was already in Neo4j and then we just did the same and started pulling data back from AWS as well. Yeah. Um, it's, so we host a few different, so we host, for Mercator we host it on-prem. It's in the data center. Yeah. Are you able to use the Neo4j data for the orchestration, or is it more of just a read-only information for Um, Read-only for monitoring. We use it for orchestration. So like, for example, to replicate that whole blue-green model in AWS, what we do is we have this concept of an app cluster. And so when you create this app cluster, there's actually like a live and dark ELB. And then there's auto-scaling groups, which is like our concept of a release. and so. We use Neo4j, so we'll spin all that stuff up in AWS and then immediately scan that into Neo4j. And so we keep track of our app cluster as a whole, which is actually just made up of a, a bunch of different AWS components. Um, so yeah, it's like, we use it, we rely very heavily on it for our cloud orchestration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So for Splunk, we'll actually, so Splunk is kind of used more in, so I mentioned MacGyver before. So a lot of um, the information in Mercator is accessed through MacGyver. MacGyver is like our do everything application. So we'll monitor things through Splunk. I think we'll run Splunk queries through MacGyver and then we'll map that then to like what app is this IP and stuff like that. And then we'll send alerts also through, through MacGyver using the Mercator information. Anything else? Yeah. To do your monitoring and query, is it mainly just hand rolled Cypher, or do you have any kind of visualization or other interfaces on top? Um, so it's mostly just handwritten Cypher. Um, we have a bunch of scripts that run on, cron, on a cron schedule, and MacGyver will just periodically, on that schedule, run the scripts. And then we'll get emailed or paged, or like 
Well, even like for, for when an app is down, we keep track of like that app's um, engineering team. So actually the engineering team will get paged with Ops Genie. Um, they'll get a message in their hip chat, um, in their hip chat room. Um, what else? I think we're working towards like for certain types of alerts. Um, maybe if, if we get an alert from New Relic, um, we're working on maybe just automatically restarting that instance. Um, with some sort of like block on like how often you restart per some amount of time, but um, we're just trying to automate more and more things away. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't know the specs on the machine. It's nothing. It's actually like it's actually one of our oldest VMs in our data center because it's like three years old or something. Um, I don't know the specs. I can get this to you though if you tweet if you tweet me. Yeah. Anything else? No, no. Okay, thanks guys.